And uh, Eva, please go ahead. I just want to remind you that after this session, we have another poster session. Then we have a keynote at six. Um, and please join us also um, in the social evening at 8 p.m. In the meanwhile, uh, in between, you're welcome to um, move around and chat in the social area in the gather. I don't know if you've already had a chance to explore it. It's really cool. There's places to sit and talk privately uh, with other people. Um, and that's it. So Eva, uh, the stage is yours, please. Okay, so hi, and thank you for joining us. Um, okay, so just a brief introduction. I was very happy to organize this symposium with Tali. And we would first like to thank Ilana, Avi, and Anoat for their participation <clears throat> and also for their involvement in the organization. And I'm really eager to hear, to finally hear the talks. <laughs> and we would also like to thank the organizer for the great conference and for the opportunity uh, with this symposium. Um, okay, so today, we're going to learn a few things about sleep. And this mysterious state called sleep is absolutely fascinating and is tightly connected to almost every aspect of our lives. And these connections are reciprocal. So experiences during the day change the properties of our nocturnal sleep and the quality and properties of sleep have an effect on the day after and further on. And in this symposium, we'll present studies from different domains with the effort to provide a glance at the diverse roles of sleep and its unique properties. Now, unfortunately, Amir was not able to join us today, but Avi has kindly agreed to present Amir's findings on the effect of timing of learning. Then I will discuss the relationship between language learning and sleep properties. Anat will reveal some of the mystery of sleep by comparing auditory processing in sleep versus wakefulness. Ilana will talk about the connection of emotion regulation strategies and insomnia. And Avi will examine sleep in the context of selecting what is to be consolidated into long-term memory and will wrap up the symposium. Now, beyond the short Q&A sessions after each talk, we will have some extra time for discussion at the end. And I would like to end this brief introduction and start the symposium by saying that in our busy lives, we are sometimes treating sleep as a waste of time, and an eight hour night's sleep is an indulgence. So I want to suggest that when you listen to the great science that is about to be presented here, remember that all of this can exist due to a very subtle balance within the sleep period. And this is based on a good nocturnal sleep. And I think, oops, sorry. And I think that uh, Matthew Walker has summarized it very accurately when he said, that sleep is not an optional lifestyle luxury. Sleep is a non-negotiable biological necessity. So with this, I'm happy to start the symposium. And so it happened <clears throat> that I'm the first speaker, so I will start my talk now. Okay. <laughs> so um, today I will talk about sleep-dependent consolidation of novel language learning. And specifically, oops, sorry. In this project, we wanted to examine how consolidation of novel words and novel morphological inflections is affected by sleep. Specifically, we want to discuss the regularity versus item learning, shorter versus longer retention, and how the distinct sleep components are related to each. Let me first tell you about our procedure. Participants arrive at the sleep lab in the evening and they perform a training and a test on the computer. During the training, they learn a small novel language. So <clears throat> they learn that this object, an apple, is called laloz in the novel language. And its plural form in the novel language is lalozam. And I've been known to the participants, there is a regularity. And base forms that end with oz, their plural form will get the suffix an. And there are three suffixes. Now, these regularities have some exceptions. There are some irregulars for the language to be more ecological. In total, participants learn 36 words. And during training, some words are presented more than others. So there are frequent words and infrequent words. And this contributes both to the 
experiment being ecological, but also it was previously found that frequent words have a different dynamics with relation to consolidation. Uh, it differs from infrequent words. So it is very relevant to introduce it in a task like that. Then the participants go to sleep and uh, we record, we do a polysomnography recording. In the morning, they perform another test. They come back on the morning after and the week after and perform two additional tests. And we have recruited 30 participants and these are the results I'm going, to, some of the results I'm going to show you today. Okay, so a polysomnography is basically an EEG recording. And while during wakefulness, our EEG signal is very diverse and different frequencies and different events appear here. In sleep, the signal becomes more and more synchronized and rhythmic. And the dominant frequency gets slower and slower as our sleep is deeper. So in N2, the frequency is slower than in N1, and in slow wave sleep, it is slower than in N2. And of course, there is also the famous REM sleep, during which the signal is actually quite similar to, wake, to wakefulness. And besides this rhythmic activity, there are also interesting events. So for example, and this is a special example because this is what we're going to discuss today. This is a sleep spindle. And sleep spindles <clears throat> are transient peaks of activity in a specific range, a specific frequency range. They occur during N2 and during slow wave sleep. Their origin is in the thalamus, but they involve a broad cortical thalamic connect corticothalamic network. And sleep spindles were shown before to be associated with learning and memory and especially consolidation during sleep. Many times in, um, in, research, in research papers, N2 and slow wave sleep are taken together. And in this context, they're called NREM, non-REM sleep, when spindles are analyzed. But in this project, we have separated these two. Now, with regard to language, spindles were found to be associated with the recall of novel items, with learning of pair associates, with the integration of newly learned words into the existing lexicon. But many questions remain open, and we will try to address some of them today. So first, do spindles have a role both in item learning and in regularity extraction? And second, are spindles during M2 versus during slow wave sleep relevant to different aspects of learning and consolidation. And it makes sense to look on N2 and slow wave sleep separately. And first, here what you see is the sleep stages of a specific participant in our experiment. So this is wakefulness, REM sleep, and one and two and slow wave sleep. And you can see that, that N2 episodes are spread throughout the night and even very close to waking up, there are still N2 episodes. Whereas slow wave sleep is concentrated mostly in the first two thirds of the night. So maybe we will see, um, we will see activity that is related to things that are happening earlier during the night more in slow wave sleep than in N2. Second, there is another special event besides spindles that is occurring during slow wave sleep. And these are the slow oscillation, slow oscillations. So slow oscillation has a typical form. It lasts about one second, a little bit more. And it's considered to synchronize neural activity and perhaps open a window to a more efficient consolidation. And it was found that after learning, slow oscillations and spindles are synchronized temporally. So there is some change in their timing so that they will come together. And thus it makes sense to ask this question separately for N2 and slow wave spindles. Uh, although this was not, this was rarely done before. Okay. Now I've told you that there are tests, there is a test in our procedure, but in fact, there are three different tests. The first is a vocabulary test. So a participant sees an apple and hears a label and has to decide whether this is the correct or incorrect label for this object. The second test is an infle inflection test. 
A participant hears a label from the experiment and a plural form and has to decide whether this is the correct plural form of this singular form. And the third is a generalization test. A participant hears a label that was not part of the training, a novel label, and has to produce the plural form of this singular form. And importantly, this is a test for item learning, just memory for pairs of object, of object label pairs. This is a test for regularity because these are novel words. So only if the participant learned that oz is related to the suffix an, she can solve this task correctly. And inflection is somewhere in between because Remembering the items from the training is very helpful, but also knowing the regularity can be very beneficial for this test. Let's look on the results. For the vocabulary, what you see on the y-axis here is the accuracy, and on the x-axis, these are the time points. So this is immediately after training in the evening. This is in the morning, morning after, and week after. And we say first that participants are well above chance, and that there is an overnight improvement, a preservation of performance, and a decay on the week after. If we look separately on frequent versus infrequent items, we see, as was shown before, a different dynamics for these two types of items. The frequent items preserve, the, the, the accuracy for these items is preserved throughout the time points, whereas for infrequent items, the initial performance is lower, and then there is sort of compensation. The consolidation helps to increase the accuracy level overnight. Then there is a preservation and a decrease on the week after. For the inflection test, first of all, here we have an additional time point, the training. We see that the training was very beneficial. And then we see a preservation of the performance across the time points. When we split to frequent and infrequent items, we see that for the frequent items, this preservation looks similar to the overall results, but for the infrequent, there is a slight decrease and a slight increase afterwards. Anyhow, we see that it is relevant to analyze these two types separately, the frequent and the infrequent. These are the results for the generalization test. Again, we see a performance which is well above chance and a preservation of the performance across time. Here, there is no point in separating the frequent and infrequent items because all these items are novel. So you, just, you should just produce the correct plural form. And now to the results with, with sleep. Okay, so first of all, when we look at the correlation between spindles during slow wave sleep, and the immediate performance in the evening, we see no correlation. On the x-axis, you see the performance in the evening, and on the y-axis, you see a measure of the amount of spindles. Specifically, I've used here spindle density, which is the number of spindles per minute. In the morning, we see a correlation for the infrequent items with the amount of spindles during slow wave sleep. And moreover, we see a correlation with the overnight improvement. So the improvement in performance overnight significantly correlates with the number of spindles during slow wave sleep in the same night. However, <clears throat> this was not replicated for the inflection task or the generalization task. We then decided to look on the longer term we have in our experiment, and that is the point a week after learning. And there, we've seen no correlation with spindles during slow wave sleep, but there is a significant correlation with spindles during N2. So the performance a week after learning significantly correlates with spindle density during the N2 phase of sleep. To summarize, We've seen that distinct sleep components are associated with learning novel items and learning irregularity. Specifically, we've seen that spindles that occur during slow wave sleep are associated with item learning, that is vocabulary, but not with regularity acquisition, that is morphological inflections. And we've seen that they are not associated with the efficacy of 
of the learning process before sleep. So it's not like a person that performs very good in uh, this learning task has many spindles. No, it's specific. A person that improves a lot during the night had many spindles. And we have also seen a hint that spindles during M2 sleep might be associated with long-term retention of novel items. And we are now testing this further. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> and I would like to thank my amazing team and the participants and the sleep lab at Tel Hai College. And uh, of course, thank you for listening. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Eva. And so, I can take Eva's questions now. Maybe one, I think we have time for one. You can also write them in the chat or open your microphone. Well, okay, but everything is clear, so we can move on to an app, I guess. Thank you, Eva. Just a sec, let me share my screen. So everyone, can you hear me well and see me well? See this presentation? Super, thanks Eva. Um, so thank you, uh, good afternoon and thank you for joining. Eva, thank you for putting together this exciting symposium and thanks to all the ISCOP team for making this wonderful conference happening uh, in these difficult circumstances. Um, my name is Anat Arzi, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Paris Brain Institute and also a visiting researcher at the University of Cambridge. And actually, I'm happy to share that in a few months, I will, opening, will open my own lab at the Hebrew University. And so it's exciting news for me. And the title of my talk today is Auditory Remapping Across the Sleep-Wake Cycle. In this study, we set out to investigate how sensory processing is modulated in sleep. But I would like to start from the beginning, um, asking, well, can we process information during sleep? Well, in the past, people thought that sleep is some kind of death, a short and irreversible death, where the brain is switched off when we fall asleep and turned back on when we wake up. For example, in the Greek mythology, Hypnos, the god of sleep, and Thanatos, the god of death, were brothers. Um, but with, with the development of science and technology, um, it was discovered that actually the brain continues to be active during sleep and process the environment. And <clears throat> we have evidence for this from our daily routine. All of us are familiar with. For example, I set my alarm clock if I want to be waking up in a specific time. And I open the curtains in the morning in my daughter's room so the sunlight will slowly wake her up. And more rare examples are the use of the smell of wasabi as a fire alarm for deaf people, for example. And indeed, there are many evidence uh, showing that um, there are brain activity in response to sensory stimuli while we're asleep. And I would like to highlight just a few from uh, the vibrant sleep uh, community here in Israel. Um, this is uh, evident during um, uh, visual presentation. So when there is a flickering light, even when we're asleep, the brain activity follows the flickers. So in red, you can see the changes during wakefulness in, in green during non-REM sleep and in blue in REM sleep. <clears throat> this is also happening in audition. So we have brain responses um, to presentation of words in specific frequencies. And here you can see the response to the frequency uh, of of different words uh, in wakefulness and here in sleep. Interestingly, this is evident also only for the frequency in which words are presented, but not when phrases and sentences uh, are being processed in sleep. This kind of processing we cannot see. 
And also <coughs> using olfaction, uh, there is a specific brain activity that is following the duration of the other presentation for 20 or 10 seconds. So indeed, uh, there are clear evidence that we can process information while we're asleep. But it's also clear that the processing is not identical in sleep and wakefulness. And to examine how it is changing, um, researchers, different studies compare the activity in wakefulness to the activity in sleep. But what was interesting that even when they use the same modality, audition, for example, and the same brain region, the auditory uh, cortex, we, the results were quite variable. So in some cases, there would be an enhanced response to auditory stimuli in sleep. In different cases, there will be a reduction of the firing rate, both in slow sleep and paradoxical sleep, which is the equivalent of REM sleep in, in rodents. And in different studies, there will be relatively preserved activity in wakefulness, non-REM, and REM sleep. And therefore, it is not clear precisely how sleep transforms our ability to process sensory information from the environment. And there are different factors that will influence our ability to process sensory information in sleep. And we hypothesize that one of these factors are the properties of the stimuli. <clears throat> and in order to address this, uh, we decided to focus on audition for multiple reasons. Uh, audition is uh, the favorite modality, I think, for sleep research. And specifically, we focused on the auditory frequency axis and on the mid part of the human audible range. And <clears throat> we used a set of tones spanning this range, which uh, the tones were equally spaced by 30%. And to address this question, we specifically how, ask how, this, um, how the neural responses to this uh, access to the auditory frequency access is changing across the sleep-wake cycle. Would the responses in sleep um, become more similar to one another? Alternatively, would they become more segregated, more different when you fall asleep? And furthermore, would the response will be one size fit all or specific to the stimuli? So some responses, some neural responses to a range of tone become more similar will either become more different or would not change. And to address this, we uh, used a relatively simple experimental design. The first step was to set a specific baseline um, to tune the brain uh, across all the stimuli. So before every tone presentation, we use an adapter tone of 500 hertz. And then we presented one of the nine different tones and the tone was presented for were presented for 100 milliseconds with a jit, small jitters between tone presentation, and they were presented in in pairs. And each pair were presented was presented for 10 times, creating a mini block and mini blocks of 10 different tones created a block. <clears throat> and while participants were awake, sitting with closed eyes, and we made sure that they are indeed awake, and we presented 24 blocks during wakefulness, which lasted for about an hour, and then the participants were comfortably lying in bed while we presented tones throughout the night, which on average was about seven hours. <clears throat> and we accumulated thousands of repetition throughout the different sleep stages. In total, 36 participants took part in our experiment and we recorded uh, the brain activity using high density EEG of 128 electrodes. And the first step in the, in the analysis we wanted was a sanity, sanity check. So we looked at the response for all the tones together um, in, an error, in the electrodes that are related to auditory responses. Here you can see the evoked response in wakefulness. And as predicted from previous finding, we indeed found a modulation of the evoked response of the ERP in stage two of sleep, slow wave and REM. And using cluster permutation, you can see by the horizontal bar where there were uh, significant differences between wakefulness and sleep. So yes, we indeed replicate pre previous funding. The evoked response in sleep are different from the ones during wakefulness. But now let's focus on our main goal. So we looked at the response for each one of the tones separately. Here in wakefulness, in dark blue is the response for the tones which had the lowest frequency in our range, 650 hertz, and that uh, T9 is the tone with the highest frequency, about 5,000 hertz. And we did the same for all the sleep stages. 
stage two slow wave and REM sleep. And we wanted to quantify the distance between different neural responses in each state. And there are different approach to measure this distance or the similarity. And the one we took, in the one we took, we calculated a measure that we call the tone similarity index. And for every pair of ERPs in response uh, to a specific tone frequency, here in the example, you can see the response in wakefulness for T1 in the darker blue and for T6 in the lighter blue. And we calculated the correlation between this pair of ERP using a running window with an overlap in order to capture the dynamics over time of this similarity index. And what did we find? So here on the y-axis is the similarity index. On the x-axis is time. The black line represents the duration of the tone. And what was clear is that the tone similarity index across all 36 tone pair were fluctuating across time in wakefulness and also in each one of the sleep stages. And we use a data-driven approach to um, classify these dynamics and we identify two time windows. The first one, the early time window, <clears throat> which was between 12 to 236 milliseconds and a late time window between 256 and almost 500, hertz, uh, 500 milliseconds. And in order um, for one processing stage not to mask the finding in a different processing stage, we analyze the results in each time window separately. First, looking at the early time window. <clears throat> so we looked at the tone similarity index here on the y-axis in wakefulness, found that on average, it was about 0.6. And we also identified some kind of a gradient <clears throat> between the 36 tone pairs. So in light gray, we see lower tone similarity index in uh, tone frequencies with lower frequencies and in dark gray between tones with higher frequencies. Looking at non rem sleep, we found a significant reduction, which was evident in all of the tone pairs, um, and an increase in the range of the tone similarity index. This was even more clear, the reduction was even more clear during slow sleep and evident during REM. And this suggests that, thanks, Eva, uh, for letting me know that there is four more, five more minutes. Um, so, um, the reduction was significant. The reduction in similarity between neural responses to different tones was significant in each one of the sleep stages. And what was even more interesting is that this reduction uh, was stimulus dependent. So we found an interaction between wakefulness and all of the sleep stages. And in order to quantify which tone pairs were modulated, um, we conducted a follow-up uh, analysis follow-up comparison. And in this figure, you can uh, see um, in each square the difference in the tone similarity index between wakefulness and sleep. So red represents higher similarity index in wakefulness, and blue higher similarity index in sleep. And we can see that all of the um, squares are indeed red, but only the one that has a small square inside of them in gray represent tone pairs where the difference was significant. And you can see that difference is significant only when a tone with low frequencies are involved and not with tones with high frequencies. This was even more clear in REM sleep, while in slow REM sleep, we see a significant reduction in all of the pairs, but not a clear pattern. So taken together, what you find in this early processing stage is that sleep reduced the similarity between neural responses to different tone frequencies. And this reduction is stimulus dependent. The modulation is not equivalent to all tone pairs. In a way, the distance, the neural distance between this tone is changing in a stimulus dependent manner. Looking at the late tone window, we found a completely different pattern. And what I would like to highlight is that there was an increase in similarity specifically 
in non-REM sleep stage two. And this indicated a unique auditory processing dynamic in this particular sleep stage. And we conducted the, um, um, we conducted several uh, follow-up uh, control analysis in order to un better understand the contribution of the intrinsic endogenous brain activity, which is typical to each one of these brain states. By definition, the brain activity is different. And in order to um, indeed check that the modulation that we see is related to the auditory processing and not just the natural uh, fluctuation in brain activity. And in addition, we did a several follow-up analysis using representational similarity analysis and comparison to different auditory models in order to better understand how sleep modulates our ability to process uh, this range of tones. And I would like to summarize by saying that what we found is sleep seems to induce some kind of functional reorganization in auditory processing. In early processing stage, the there is a decrease in the similarity of neural activity in all sleep stages, stage two, slow wave, and REM. And it seems that this decrease is stimulus dependent. In the late processing stage, we see mostly an increase in non-REM sleep of stage two. And we can look at this together that in wakefulness, we have some kind of a map. So there is a specific distance, neural distance between the different tone frequencies. In sleep, in the early stage, it seems that this map is in a way shrinking and twisting. So the differences, the similarity is smaller, uh, but it's smaller in a different way, depends on the stimulus. And then in the late processing, there is some kind of expansion only in non-REM sleep in stage two. And this study gave us some answer, but in a way opened many more questions. So what determines this modulation, this reorganization. And I think that there are many factors. One of them is the physical properties of the stimuli that we are using. Other is the context of the uh, presented uh, stimuli. Also, previous experience and familiarity are important factors. And in order to get a wider view of how sleep modulates and transform our ability to process information, we need to systematically uh, tweak all of this parameter and then get a richer understanding of sensory processing in sleep. And if you would like to know more about how we process information in sleep, you are very much welcome to join our poster tomorrow, which will be presented by Malka. And if you are fascinated by processing under loss of consciousness, in sleep and also in other states, such as disorder of consciousness, and you have the passion to further investigate it, feel free to reach out. And um, this is what I'll be studying in my own research group at the Hebrew University. And you're, um, you're very uh, welcome to write and, uh, <clears throat> and stay in touch and suggest collaboration. And just one more thing, um, to thank the dream team that helped this study happen. My uh, advisor, mentor Tristan Beckenstein at uh, Cambridge and all these wonderful people who made me smile during the days and during the nights. And of course, the funding bodies that made all of this possible. Um, so thank you very much to all of you for listening. I don't see questions in the chat, but if someone wants to ask the question, oh, there are hands raised. Do it. So, Liat. Hi, thank you. Uh, it was a great talk and another great study by you, which is uh, always great to see. So, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask did I understand, is, would you say that it's a correct interpretation of the results to say that we become more sensitive when we sleep, at least at the beginning, because it seems like the, the responses become more divergent? So, we might you know, be able to differentiate between more stimuli, like if the scale is expanding? I think it's an excellent question. And we would like to address this specifically in one of our, our follow-up um, analysis and to do decoding. I think decoding will give us a more accurate answer regarding our ability to discriminate between the stimuli. Um, 
and then I could be um, providing a richer view regarding this. It's a very good uh, point that uh, we didn't add to this manuscript. Thank you for highlighting this. Um, okay, so Tali and Daniel. Um, yes, we still have time, so Daniel. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Anat. Lovely. To first, a question: uh, the frequencies that you know that you were using over here, how do they map out on a sort of a, a cochlear uh, representation of frequency differences? Right, where you have, you know, not the absolute frequencies in hertz, but rather the size of, you know, the strength of representation in cochlear terms. Would, would you see the same divergence? Um. So. Uh... The frequencies that we use are from 500 to 5,000 hertz. And one of the auditory models that we uh, use in order to better understand the pattern of activity was the Greenwood model, which exactly measured the distance on the basilar membrane uh, between every pair of, uh, of stimulus. Um, I can share just a sec. Um, So this is this model. So just very briefly, we use three models, one looking at the difference in Hertz between the different tone, one assessing exactly that the distance on the basal or membrane in the, in the cochlea, and one looks at the behavioral measure. And for all of the states, except slower, which was interesting in several aspects, um, the best model was actually the behavioral one, in wakefulness and in sleep. The basilar one, uh, the green wood, which reflect the difference, uh, the distance in the cochlea was better than just the pure frequency. Um, so this is how we addressed, uh, in a way, your question. Ali? Thank you, it was fascinating. Um, my question is, uh, do you see a function or an advantage for these, these changes in the distance? Or do you think it's just an epiphenomenon of what the brain is doing for other purposes? This is something that I really want to understand. What determines this modulation? Whether there are stimuli that are particularly important and we want to be able to process them as well as in wakefulness because they have evolutionary uh, importance, for example, would, this, would it be something that we can manipulate by learning? So if we learn that this stimuli is important, I don't know, uh, for a fire alarm, would we see that the modulation is, is smaller in sleep? And I think that there are many factors in addition to when it happens during the, the uh, specific stage, right? During the up state or uh, down state of the slow wave in spindle. Um, and we need, a, to systematically manipulate each one of these factors to get a better answer. So the bottom line is, I think these results are relative. They're not absolute. If we use the same frequencies with a deep, different adapter or with people with musical training, I think we would see modulation, but not necessarily this exact modulation. I don't think that they are printed on, into our brain, but we are uh, the sum of our experiences. And this would uh, determine how, the, how sleep will modulate our uh, our processing. This is how I see it. So there is a lot of work, of work to be done, and I'm very open to many collaborations. Thank you so much, Anat. Um, so Ilana has a question, but I want to move on to the next speaker, which is also Ilana. So maybe we will keep your question to the discussion at the end. So time. So our next speaker is Ilana. Yeah, probe your brain afterwards, Anat. <laughs> Um, I have a, so I'll just share my screen. And I'll hide this. Oops. Okay, so. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks, thank you, Eva and Tali, for inviting me. 
um, and to the organizers of this conference. Um, it's kind of it's fun to participate in a conference, even if it's uh, from home. Um, and I apologize for the length of my title, but I am going to talk um, less about brain plasticity and more about uh, insomnia and cognitive processes involved in insomnia. And the reason I think it's important to talk about insomnia and symptoms in, of insomnia is because of the high incidence of sleep difficulty in the general population. So studies range to up to 50% of adults in any given year report difficulty in sleep. And the problem is that once such symptoms uh, appear, they tend to persist and they predict poor physical health and poor mental health. Um, since we live in a capitalist society, it's worth mentioning that these untreated insomnia symptoms have a cost. Uh, people who have more insomnia symptoms tend to utilize healthcare services more because their immune system is compromised, because they are um, they make more mistakes, more, more uh, accidents. And there, there is loss of productivity because they are tired at work, distracted, make more errors, uh, or sometimes just don't show up. So insomnia symptoms are an issue for us as a society. What does it mean to have insomnia symptoms? Like most psychiatric disorders, like all psychiatric disorders, I should say, uh, insomnia is measured subjectively. So individuals will report having difficulty initiating and or maintaining sleep. Their, their sleep is insufficient or not refreshing. Um, and they attribute difficulties during the day to their sleep problems. Now, the mechanisms involved in experiencing insomnia are complex and not well understood. Um, stress, life, life stressors are obviously a, uh, a predisposing factors. There could be other sources of predisposition, perhaps genetic, perhaps other neurophysiological aspects that could uh, predispose individuals to develop insomnia. However, the insomnia itself is attributed to some level of cognitive and neurophysiological arousal. So in fact, the current model of uh, insomnia is the cognitive model, uh, kind of described, I think, best by Alison Harvey. Um, and the idea is that um, people with insomnia tend to have excessive negatively toned uh, thoughts or cognitive activity, which leads them to have increased arousal and experience distress. The arousal causes them to kind of monitor themselves and monitor the environment more vigilantly to detect sources of threat to their sleep. And this kind of leads to uh, catastroph catastrophization and feeling that, well, I'm not getting enough sleep, the whole, my whole day is shot. And then you wake up the next morning, and of course, you are excessively thinking about all the all, all your bad sleep. So we have we developed this uh, vicious cycle that basically uh, creates and maintains uh, insomnia. I'm going to focus on this aspect of it, on the excessive negatively tone cognitive activity, which in some on some level is a definition of rumination. So rumination as a symptom is transdiagnostic. You see it in depression and anxiety disorders, um, um, bipolar disorders, PTSD, and of course in insomnia. Uh, it's defined as negative valence, perseverative, self-referential thoughts. However, let's put a pin in the negative valence because we'll talk about that more in a minute. But what is known about rumination that in non-clinical uh, participants is associated with increased uh, autonomic activities, uh, increased sympathetic activity, reduced parasympathetic. So you have basically the component of physiological arousal. Neuroimaging studies uh, find that rumination is associated with hypoactivation of the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is um, 
involved or presumably involved in uh, control of uh, emotion related cognitions and hyperactivation and or medial prefrontal cortex portion of the default mode network, which has also been shown to be uh, hyperactive in depressed participants. So neurophysiologically, rumination seems to involve physiological and neurophysiological arousal. Um, the question is, does it have to be negative? So Nolan Hoxima was the kind of person who uh, first started studying rumination, uh, defined it as a process of thinking perseveratively about one's own feelings and problems rather than in terms of specific content of thought. So she's not actually saying anything about negative. And indeed, uh, Feldman and colleagues in 2008 uh, suggested the possibility that you would have positive rumination. So we'd have preservative cognitions focused on positive content. Research into the context of positive rumination has found that it's associated with kind of trait positive affect. So people who are generally happy and easygoing and with reduced depressive symptoms. Um, kind of, I should note, the positive affect is also, at least in some studies, been associated with uh, higher quality sleep or improved sleep. However, positive rumination has also been associated with dysregulation of positive affect, especially in individuals with bipolar disorder, so they're vulnerable to hypomanic or manic episodes, and also in eating disorders, which would kind of uh, suggest that perhaps positive rumination is some sort of neurophysiological or neurocognitive arousal uh, that may interfere with sleep, because in both manic episodes and in eating disorders, we have uh, insomnia. So the, the rationale for this study was assuming that ruminations interfere with sleep, is this interference valence dependent? That is negative ruminations uh, make you feel worse and then you have worse sleep versus positive ruminations make you feel better and then your sleep is better? Or does rumination per se independent of valence uh, uh, interfere with sleep? So that's kind of the first hypothesis. The second question uh, was based on the fact that the study is done, was done in uh, a healthy population or, or non-clinical population. And therefore, you could imagine that someone lying in bed and beginning to ruminate about uh, their daily hassles and what they have to do tomorrow, they will start to engage in some emotion regulation strategies to allow themselves to fall asleep. And we focus here on two uh, types of emotion regulation strategies, reappraisal, which means that we change the meaning of the stimulus that is causing us to be emotionally aroused versus suppression, which is basically changing the outcome. So the stimulus is making me angry, but I'll just take a deep breath and close my eyes and think about something else. Um, so these are two uh, emotion regulation strategies that could allow us to go to sleep. Um, and how, how they will interact with rumination is a question, but in theory, reappraisal is associated with uh, better, uh, uh, healthier cog cognitions and healthier uh, emotions. And so you would expect better sleep quality while suppression has more short-term effects and turns to come the emotions tend to come back after a while. So it may not have any positive effects on sleep. So in, in this study, uh, this was a survey performed, uh, participated in 300, about 350 people. The eligibility was basically age 18 to 50. The mean age of participants was 30. You can see on the right of the table that there was an overrepresentation of women, about 60% were women. Um, given the age, about two thirds were married, um, they were generally healthy. 
And you can see at the bottom that there was a nice distribution of insomnia symptoms. There were about 40% who had uh, subclinical symptoms and 24% uh, who met criteria for moderate insomnia. So we have kind of a whole range of symptoms, insomnia symptoms in this uh, sample. The instruments we use were first the insomnia severity index, which is a, a clinical instrument which has been validated in many languages. I'm actually not sure that it's been validated in Hebrew, but um, it's considered a reliable uh, measure of insomnia. In addition, individual respondents were required to uh, uh, inform us regarding their bedtime, wake time, total sleep time, and sleep onset latency in the past week. So we had some more uh, sleep information. To measure rumination, we used several instruments. The rumination, ruminative response scale developed by Nolan Hoxima measures negative rumination. It asks questions regarding uh, feelings and cognitions regard regarding negative uh, emotions. So I think how alone I feel, or I think how hard it is for me to get going. So these are, I'm thinking about how my life is shit, <laughs> kind of. Um, uh, as far as uh, positive rumination, we use the response to positive affect questionnaire developed by Feldman. This questionnaire has uh, two components to it. One is uh, uh, positive rumination, kind of the, mirror image of a negative rumination the thoughts about feeling good. So I think about how happy I feel, that I'm achieving a lot and I'm savoring the moment. Those are the items that people respond to. The other aspect of it is what they call dampening. So again, the, the, the content is positive, but the, the purpose is to downregulate. So I think that my streak of luck is going to end soon or people are going to think I'm bragging. So I feel good, but let's not exaggerate. So trying to dampen the positive emotion. And to uh, measure uh, emotion regulation, we used uh, Jane Gross's, Jane Gross's uh, emotion regulation questionnaire that has uh, two components, uh, items related to the appraisal. So when I want to feel more positive, I change what I'm thinking about. So I'm changing basically the stimulus to make me feel better versus uh, suppression. I try to control my emotions by not expressing them, okay? So the emotion is already there. I'm just trying to uh, suppress it. So those were the instruments and just kind of, uh, initially just kind of to give us an idea that at least regarding uh, insomnia symptoms, we have some sort of internal validity. Uh, people who had higher scores on the insomnia severity index uh, had uh, slept less, so reported less sleep and uh, a longer time to fall asleep. So these individual respondents were um, uh, consistent with themselves. Also, it's worth noting that the bedtime was not correlated with the insomnia severity index, so we don't have some weird uh, distribution of uh, circadian disorders in this sample. Okay, so our first hypothesis was whether, kind of first question was whether uh, the association between rumination and uh, insomnia uh, symptoms is associated with valence versus cognitive arousal. You can see on the left is the correlation between negative rumination and insomnia symptoms. And the, the correlation is uh, medium to high and, and a very clear positive correlation that there's more negative rumination associated with more insomnia symptoms. That's not really surprising. In the center are the positive uh, correlations. And you can see that there is uh, a slight negative correlation. I would, given the size of the sample, it's significant. However, it's really, it's a very weak correlation, probably. Uh, so you're experiencing a positive emotion, but you're trying to downplay it. And here again, you have a positive correlation. So more dampening is associated with 
more symptoms of insomnia. The second, uh, the second hypothesis uh, was uh, asked whether uh, reappraisal and uh, suppression moderate the association between rumination and sleep symptoms. Um, so here we, uh, we're focusing on the association between negative rumination and insomnia symptoms. The table is basically the results from a hierarchical regression where the, in the second step, the interaction term between uh, rumination and uh, reappraisal or rumination and suppression was entered. And you can see that in both cases, the interaction term was not significant. And indeed, if you look at the data, so on the left are, are the correlations between uh, negative rumination and, oh, shit. Ilana, you're connected. It's only your uh, PowerPoint that is lost. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we, you're with us. Okay, because I thought, I thought that was off Zoom. Okay. No, 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 you're with okay. us. We just don't see your um, PowerPoint. That's weird. Okay. Okay, now, now you're on. Okay, sorry about that. That was weird. Um, the uh, so so, uh, so uh, just to recap the the negative rumination was uh, in the model with reappraisal maintained a positive correlation with insomnia symptoms both with reappraisal and suppression. However, the interaction term was not uh, correlated with insomnia symptoms in both uh, for both reappraisal and for suppression. For the positive rumination, so actual positive rumination, the, the interaction term for both reappraisal and for suppression was significant. Um, basically what happened was that, uh, that positive rumination, as you, as you saw before, was not actually uh, associated with insomnia symptoms. However, when we enter the interaction term, for reappraisal, we had uh, a positive association. So the, basically reappraising positive uh, rumination caused more, uh, more sleep uh, disturbance, while suppression had the opposite effect. So uh, suppress, suppression of positive rumination was associated with less insomnia symptoms. Um, finally, looking at dampening, uh, kind of similar to what we saw with the positive rumination in both reappraisal and suppression, there was a positive, uh, a significant interaction. Dampening has a positive association with insomnia symptoms, both with reappraisal in the model and the suppression in the model. Uh, the interaction term with reappraisal uh, reverses this effect, so basically, when we appraising uh, dampening, yeah, that improves sleep or there, there are less sleep uh, uh, symptoms. And uh, uh, suppression basically attenuates the positive correlation. So I'll just recap kind of what I showed you. So the first hypothesis was asking whether the association was valence driven or cognitive hyperarousal driven. 
and we saw that both the negative rumination and uh, dampening of positive affect were both associated with more uh, insomnia symptoms, whereas positive rumination was only marginally associated with less insomnia symptoms, perhaps not at all. With regards to the moderation hypothesis, uh, negative rumination was not moderated by either reappraisal or suppression. And both the positive rumination scales were moderated in slightly uh, different but com complementary directions. So positive rumination with reappraisal caused basically interfered with sleep. Uh, uh, positive rumination with suppression uh, was associated with less insomnia symptoms. Dampening, which is associated with more insomnia symptoms, was decreased by both reappraisal and by suppression. So, if I, so just to conclude, the, it seems that ruminating on both negative emotions and positive, uh, as on positive uh, emotions, but trying to dampen the response to them are both associated with more insomnia symptoms while just thinking positive about how great my life is, doesn't seem to have an, any strong effect on sleep either way. And, and also positive rumination, but not negative rumination, was moderated by emotion, other emotion regulation strategies, especially suppression had a, had a significant effect in uh, reducing the interfering effects of positive rumination. So obviously this is a cross-sectional study. This is not a, uh, there's no manipulation, it's not in the lab, and it needs to be done in, in such a way as to more directly test the causal relationships between these measures. Um, but I should mention that I, to my knowledge, this is the first study that actually looks at the association of positive rumination and sleep in the general population. And of course, uh, insomnia is a clinical disorder and more uh, kind of a better understanding of these mechanisms should be studied in a clinical population. So I kind of uh, just like to thank my collaborators, Lilach Portal and Tal Kaumon. And of course, uh, again, thank the organizers and William Shakespeare, who also talked about uh, rumination more than 500 years ago and that's about it thank you yeah thank you so much Ilana um i think we better move on to our next speaker and keep the questions for the discussion at the end so we are now moving to Avi. Ilana, can you close the yeah 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 I just uh, the share. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so thank you. Um, both uh, Eva and Tali asked me to try and present somewhat of an overview. So I'll try and present a perspective which relates to sleep, but I think also important, especially in terms of learning is time um, in relation to the ideas that actually came up uh, during this uh, good and very interesting session. So let me just say the obvious uh, initially, um, sleep, introduces distinct brain states to the cycle that we undergo of uh, daily cycle of sleep and wake. And as we have seen, um, the, these CNS cycles um, have that um, during sleep actually have distinct stages and distinct intervals in which there are electrical activity patterns which are unique, such as spindles or slow wave sleep. And also there is on the biochemical side, 
there are distinct neuromodulator levels, so different brain environment, which uh, cause or are part of the different brain states. And this all means that there's actually distinct connectivity patterns, which Anat has not talked about, but um, um, has the data. Um, the important thing is that although sleep is crucial for survival, it is also important for our well being. And the effects are reciprocal, so that emotional state and awake experiences shape our sleep, but then sleep by itself is necessary to enable us um, good functioning. And the third point I think that was raised during this session, we actually looked at this, the fact that experiences, which could be perceptual or emotional, ongoing or um, uh, preceding sleep, are differentially processed during sleep state. So sleep is not simply a shutdown event. Now, importantly, as related to memory and learning, sleep states have a role in memory consolidation, which I'll explain in a moment. But the, the important aspect is that post-learning time in sleep is not equivalent in terms of the brain states that are afforded to the learner's brain as in um, time spent in the wake state. And of course, Amir, Amir Grossfeld was supposed to present it, but Eva presented some data towards this point, and I'll try in a moment to show part of Amir's data relating to that. So we can ask three important questions. So the first question is, I think, if we look at the effects of sleep as it interacts with the learning and memory is why long-term memory got separated from learning. The second question, why we have two uh, long-term memory systems, declarative and procedural. And then of course, the third question, which is I was leading to, is why sleep matters for learning and memory. So just one slide per each of these um, questions. Which, it, um, um, which are the following. So why learning and long-term memory got separated? I think that this is because long-term memory generation must be strictly controlled. And the reason is that the biological substrates of long-term memory are structural changes. Yes, they are microscopic, they occur only in synapses, but um, these are structural changes in our brain's hardware, and this brain hardware, neural machinery, is the one that serves the representations of all our experiences, present and past. And so because structural changes are metabolically expensive and they are ir irreversible, um, which we refer to them as consolidation, and they must and need to be controlled. And what a time interval or a long time interval before these changes actually are affected in our brains actually allows for an opportunity for um, stopping the process and then not interfering with the important machinery um, um, that uh, would change if consolidation processes would um, continue. So there are, I would like to say there are distinct sets of processes. One process is learning, where we do the best with what we have in during the learning experience. And it's like, um, um, uh, adaptations or um, priming or um, um, uh, um, setting up in, in reversible uh, uh, routines to solve a current problem. And it's fast, it's metabolically cheap. And of course, the important thing, it's reversible. But the generation of long-term memory is slow, it's metabolically expensive, 
and importantly, it's irreversible. And what we actually get in consolidation processes is in fact a growth process. So synapses actually grow. And, 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 and what we have is lasting structural changes in our brain's machinery as the basic mechanism for um, long-term memory. So then there's the question of why we have two memory system, well, major long-term memory system. Most of us would answer that this is because different things need to be retained. And the standard answer is that different types of things require different um, mechanisms. And so statements and events, for example, as compared to skills, my take on it is actually that different learning experiences probably require different mechanisms in order to initiate consolidation processes. And then we would look at singular events versus repeating events, so non-repeating versus repeating event. And this, of course, maps into our idea of declarative versus procedural long-term system. Now, importantly, is that in both systems, um, what matters is that consolidation processes take hours to be completed. And so time after the lesson and one, what happens um, to the learner during the memory consolidation interval are critical for both of these systems. And so why do sleep um, um, stages or states afforded by sleep matter for learning and memory? I think we can probably pose two possible um, mechanisms. One is the notion that um, um, our brain states available in sleep are advantageous for advancing consolidation processes. And the other is the no and, um, a corollary or an, uh, another idea is that in some cases, in fact, these processes are necessary or sleep states are necessary or critical. So we have something that is available only during sleep, but not during the awake state in order to com successfully complete consolidation processes. And then there's also the um, notion that sleep um, uh, affords less interference. Let me, let me just uh, um, uh, explain that in a moment. So we have good idea to show that sleep affects synaptic growth, so consolidation processes. We can show that in, in a roundabout and indirect manner in the human brain, where um, time and, and, and sleep effects can be correlated with changes in, in, in function, but we can directly show that if we look at rodent and laboratory animal studies, where uh, we can show that um, the modulation of uh, synaptic uh, structure as a function of learning as basis for long-term memory is indeed sleep dependent. Let me show you, however, how this, these, this process of consolidation can be seen in human behavior. And any of you might be um, um, very conversant, I've seen before such like demonstrations. But for example, here's a learning of a sequence of finger movements. So it would be finger to thumb opposition movement. And what we find is that if we train on such finger movement, we actually get an, 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 an a very significant and robust increase in our ability to perform the sequence repeatedly, so speed and accuracy, if we compare before training to our um, ability to do the task, um, generate the sequence, uh, the movement sequences after learning. Importantly, however, during the next few hours until we go to sleep, no change occurs in the level of um, a, a performance that we attained um, um, at that uh, 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 at the end of the session, but. The next morning, and we've seen some 
similar demonstration, for example, in Ivers um, uh, uh, data, we see very significant delayed gains or very significant effects of the consolidation processes that took part, but are actually um, manifest in behavior only after sleep has been afforded. And, and in fact, we don't need a night's sleep. So if we just allow participants to have a nap or a short interval of sleep during daytime, we get the um, expression of delayed gains um, when they wake up. So um, uh, sleep in this type of task seems to be providing a necessary brain state or a necessary factor in order to successfully complete um, 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 consolidation processes. Although it's very clear that before sleep, whatever has been learned is kept in, 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 in and is available for ourselves, but in a different form, non-consolidated. Okay. But we do know, however, and here I simply put out my um, very first sleep and learning study. So in this study, we were, in fact, we looked at consolidation phase gains, but in a perceptual term, we already showed that there is good, there are good consolidation phase gains, not only in sleep, in this task, it's actually um, very much, it's a visual discrimination task. It's very much REM dependent. But also, we can get very similar consolidation phase gains during the awake state. And one can see that, in fact, performance improves. Okay, performance improves. Going down is um, faster performance or less time for performing the task and, and occurs not only during REM sleep, but actually also in the awake state. So, here and in other perceptual tasks, there's actually good evidence to suggest that sleep is not always necessary. It is beneficial, but it's not necessary um, in order to um, uh, uh, consolidate and generate long-term memory for a skill. So it seems that plasticity in perceptual systems is sleep independent, but if you want to have um, consolidation during sleep, it depends on REM. However, in other tasks, and specifically our uh, actual behavior is going to change, it seems that sleep might be necessary in some time. And then we talk about spindles and stage two and slow wave sleep and so on. So there's actually different sleep stages matter in different times of um, different kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, learning experiences. So let me show you how this looks for um, uh, mini language learning. And this is Amir Grossfield's data, which sadly he was unable to show us today. So it's a game which has a board. You can win it at a, in a certain set of moves. And it has a language which actually describes the tokens and the moves, and there's syntax. So there are actually about a thousand sentences that can be generated in this language, which describe all of the moves that can be performed by each of these tokens um, in order to uh, play the game. And what subjects do is that they, they, they are taught the vocabulary, the syntax, and then they practice playing the game, but using um, a LAN game, the language related to this board game. And what you see here is performance, which is, by the way, very robust and very good in terms of perf um, performance time. So let's say utterance or how fast or how long does it take to generate a correct phrase in the language, OK? And what you see here after a morning lesson and um, playing the game, what you see here is that by evening, the time to generate such um, um, sec uh, uh, sentences in the new language actually has not changed. And if we test these subjects the next morning, 
we see that they are at the same level as they were the evening before. However, if the same um, um, lesson is afforded to similar adults um, in the evening hours, what we see that overnight, there's a very significant reduction, okay, on the order of 15 to 20% in, in terms of um, a utterance duration time, to the time it takes to, so fluency increases, and this is well maintained um, the next evening, so um, also across the next day, and we have data showing, or Mir has data showing that even a month later, everything is well retained. In fact, if we look at the accuracy of the sentences produced, we see that if after morning lesson, subjects actually show both in pronunciation and vocabulary a decline, so accuracy declines. However, after evening lessons, what we get is we get um, less, uh, less uh, um, um, errors and definitely the big gain in, 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 um, in speed and fluency is not at the cost of, um, uh, of more mistakes. So one possibility is that in fact, what we see in this morning versus evening um, a different um, a, a, a design, a study design, is an effect of daytime interference. And in order to check that, what Amir did is that he compared another group of evening learners. So again, the, the session is at evening. And these, however, these um, uh, learners were asked to play the game in Hebrew after they have been, um, they, they had the training session in Langame, okay? And what we find is that indeed, this very brief experience of, um, with one's um, native language in the context of the new game actually resulted in, in the loss of the gains in fluency and accuracy um, overnight. So, Yes, there seems to be a very strong interference effect, which of course, if we um, compare morning to evening um, lesson, there would be a whole daytime interval for interference in during the day. However, much less language experience, like Hebrew language experience, native language experience, um, to interfere um, with what we find in 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 um, uh, during during a night a comparable night interval. However, sleep does more than that because we know that after sleep, there's no decline in accuracy in the next twenty four hours. Something that we do see. Okay, very clearly when when um, a, there's um, an e, um, a morning lesson. So night does a night sleep does contribute or a night interval does contribute selectively also to um, 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 making robust um, uh, our ability to generate accurate sentences more robust. So sleep can be advantageous for consolidation processes because sleep stage states that are available in sleep are advantageous. So something um, we they does uh, they do something helpful, which however could have also occurred during the wake state, but also in some cases they are critical or available only in provide factors that are available only in sleep um, for the completion of uh, consolidation processes. And the second point, of course, is that sleep there is reduced susceptibility to interference. So again, there is an, an effect of time of day. So this introduces the notion of time of day, and I, I'll, I'll devote a minute to it. Okay, so 
time of day, that time in which we experience the the um, what the, the we we experience the learning, or we we have or undergo the learning experience, um, it can uh, is of course um, important because what what of what follows because of the next interval after a morning lesson is more likely to contain um, daily activities which can potentially interfere with what we would have um, um, uh, uh, with um, consolidation processes initiated by the learning session. However, um, if the uh, um, uh, the learning experience occurs during the evening, then um, of course there is less opportunity um, for interference. However, learning ability per se is also affected by time of day. And this is because of um, issues of and an, an, an effects of chronobiology, because our natural um, um, our our um, uh, biological clocks actually can set up times which are more effective throughout the the, you know, the daily cycle for learning, for being alert, for um, being able to generate or um, um, acquire new knowledge. And um, because of these two effects, we actually um, um, should consider that when we ask the question of whether um, um, sleep is or is not critical or important in terms of consolidation um, processes, we actually have to take into account when we design our studies, also the notion the time of day per se, may make a difference. And just to show you an example, this comes from Mahmoud Sindiani, who is a PhD student at my lab work. What you can see here is um, just immediately after a text lesson, okay, um, how much of the text or items from the text subjects remember, what you can see is that, um, um, uh, well, typical adults, do much better in the morning as compared to evening lessons, same evening lesson, it's a crossover study, so it's the same subject. Um, in subjects with ADH, ADHD, for example, evening lessons are much better, okay? So they do poorly at morning, but they do much, much better if the lesson comes at the evening. So both the learning and the susceptibility to interference are dependent on individual factors. So that would be the chronotype and biological factors on the one side. And on the other side, the actual experience that one undergoes during the interval after the lesson. Now, because these individual factors, there should be, and we should expect, and we do find them, and we saw, for example, in, in the data um, of Eva, and we saw in the data, I think, um, um, uh, Anat's data, um, there should be big between individual variability, okay? Um, we actually saw that also in Ilana's data, there are huge variabilities and we should expect that. And I think that at least in part, um, this variability pertains to chronobiological factors. However, in terms of how important or how um, uh, critical sleep is, we should be very, very careful in providing at this stage of our knowledge, yes, no, um, answers to the question, because I think there are lots of factors, not the least of which are individual factors, which are um, critical in, in deciding whether a learning experience will um, uh, result in the end in long-term memory and improved abilities. Thank you.
Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much. Um, so we now have time for questions for Ali, but also for other speakers as well. May I? Uh, may I ask? Hey, I don't know who's talking, but hey. Uh, Sharon Gilaidotan. Hello, Avi, hi, uh, very nice talk and interesting. I wanted to ask if you think this would generalize, I mean, if this is specific to language or if it would generalize to other types of memory, for example, even images, um, these effects, uh, let's say morning and evening effects. Um, I mean, the system is also occupied with a lot of just visual inputs, not specific to language. Uh, so do you think this is kind of like a fatigue effect or I was thinking of the, you know, Shaya Gnon's uh, book about Tehila, that that's about her lifetime. But anyway, you can think about a day she used up all her um, language or words for the day. Uh, anyway, um, so do you think this is language specific or do you think it's uh, more general? I think it's the, um, the mechanisms of general but then the constraints are specific. And so um, I would probably say that we have to be very, very careful not, not to overgeneralize the results of, that come out of a specific study. But what I do think is that definitely in all of the different, and I actually showed some data from one perceptual task, but there are others as well. Um, it's definitely not something to do specifically with language learning. It's, mm -hmm. It has been shown initially in simple movement sequence learning and so on. So all consolidation phase gains have been shown in perceptual as well as motor and also in even in higher level tasks. So the process is there. And we mm -hmm. do believe that it's the same repertoire of mechanisms that underlies all of them. But in relation to sleep, it seems that there's a complexity there. And my idea or basic idea is that we have to be very careful in generalizing because I think there are some aspects which relate, on the one hand, to uh, the type of knowledge or task or behavior that is going to change as a function of uh, our learning experience, and second, because of uh, um, individual factors. But I think the basic mechanisms are actually shared. It's just the constraints themselves that are different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Ali? Hi, thanks, Avi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you suggested that Amir's data, and particularly the reduction in, or the increasing fluency in the morning for the evening, the, the group that was trained in the evening, can be explained by just interference, daytime interference. Uh, okay, uh, and then he said th this could be interference, but then the recovery uh, or the, the lack of uh, interference, uh, it, this is an indication of, of uh, an active uh, effect of the sleep. So I wondered, I think if, if it was just inter data in interference, you would expect just maintenance of the fluency from the evening in the evening group rather than delayed gains. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Or is there more than just interference even in this specific finding? Absolutely, yes. And I, and, and I could not present it because Amira's talk was a, a whole talk about it. But if you look at individuals, you can see that very clearly. In fact, there are some individuals who show very robust gains in fluency across the data, but all of them, except two, show across nighttime. It's a big study. Amir now has almost 100 subjects. So yes, it's, it's, there's a big difference, but you can see improvement. So 
um, even across a daytime. And of course, you can say, well, maybe these are very reticent uh, uh, individuals. Uh, they have minimal social interactions. They don't use Hebrew, maybe. I don't know. OK, so but but definitely the, there are individuals who show um, very nice delayed gains across the 12 hour interval of daytime. So we cannot say it's everything has uh, um, sorry that sleep is necessary. On the other hand, what we see is that after, um, after sleep, we um, get in, in that the, uh, there is a 12 hour interval that follows and um, in the evening learners and uh, of a whole daytime of using their native language. And these subjects do not show any loss. In fact, they show um, some gains in some parameters of the task. And if we look at um, a more delayed time point, that is a month later, we really see that they have, be, they have continued to improve. So the, the point is that once I've slept on it, I'm much less susceptible to upcoming, upcoming interference, something that we don't see when the post-learning interval is the wake interval in the morning learners. So the important um, time interval is really the first time interval after the lesson. But I have to restrict that because each test is also, in a way, some reminder and lesson. So it's even more complex than that. But I don't believe that it's interference, the only aspect. I actually think that sleep does contribute. But on the other hand, we can't say that sleep is critical. I can actually say another thing. If we look at tasks which are not production in Amir's task, so like a judgment task, then the advantage of sleep is even smaller. So sleep seems to be um, more critical when production is involved. So that's a good answer also for the previous answer. So when production is in, involved, it seems to me that sleep is more critical, perhaps this is again a motor behavior. We do something differently rather than a perceptual thing. Okay, I I don't think I agree with that based on Eva's uh, results, which were all uh, non-production, or not all, but the vocabulary which showed the the effects were were not related to production, but re related to that, Eva, if I can take one more minute. Uh, question, uh, no, a question. No, a, a continuation uh, with a question to Avi. Oh, if there is time. Whatever you prefer. I think we have time for one more question. So maybe if you have one for Ilana, well, whatever you choose. I uh, just wanted to, to clarify because Eva showed this difference, or which we think is a difference between item specific learning and learning of regularities, uh, which in Eva's study was, I mean, we only found the, the effect of sleep when looking at item-specific learning, namely vocabulary, rather than learning of, vocab of uh, regularities. So I wondered the tasks that you showed the results from Amir's study, was that trained items or trained sentences, or was it all novel, like transfer kind of uh, task? All novel, all novel because we can't, there are a thousand, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it's all of them are novel. None of them relates to, there are a thousand sentences possible. So it's very easy to generate new uh, sentences, which refer to, I mean, all of these vocabulary items, of course, have been learned during the lesson, but the, or the subject has been exposed to them, but not in the sentences which have been used. And then when they generate sentences in the production task or listen, 
see movies and describe the movements and so on. But what we what um, uh, the token movement on the board, what they what they do is they generate new sentences. So it's it's kind of mixed compared to Eva's uh, study, but it's more like novel novel uh, sentences. But items have been learned. So I don't know. It's Thank complex. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. And Marit, are we out of time or do you want to? What's, what's our situation? I, I think we are. Uh... A good time to say thank you so much to all the people uh, organizing and uh, lecturing in the symposium. So please unmute yourself and give them a clap. Thank you, every, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's a poster session at 3.30 till 5.30 and then a keynote at 6 and social evening at 8. So thanks again for everybody and see you later. Bye. To Daeva, to Dathali. To Daeva, I'm a Mashmini. To Dalachem. To Dathali.